So uh, welcome back. I know there's a lot of questions on the homework, and I'm going to start with one that has or, that I've already promised to go over in class, and then I'll ask you if you have others. So um, this is uh, the question I've been asked the most is about problem five, the Ehrenfest urn model. So um, homework three, number five. Uh, we have the this urn model, and which I'm going to make a box model because I don't want to have to draw an urn. And we've got two urns, one and two, or boxes. And we've got a total of D balls in the boxes. And so Xn is supposed to be the number in box one at any time. At every time step, we randomly select a ball. Now, the labels are not really important here. The, the point is that you randomly select a ball regardless of what urn it is. So that's why they're labeled because you're gonna randomly select like these five things I've drawn, you're gonna randomly select one of the five. So you're not randomly selecting out of one urn and moving to the other, you're randomly selecting one ball from the total balls, which is why they were labeled. But other than that, the labels are not important. So Xn is supposed to be the number in box one at the nth trial. Okay, so we have a an initial distribution, which is a binomial distribution. Doesn't really look like it, but the p and one minus p are the same. So why the heck did I write it like that? But the combination on the right side really doesn't look like it, but it's a binomial with um, parameters d and one half. And we wanna find the distribution of x1. So before we can do anything, I think we need to find some transition probabilities. So let's uh, let's check a few out. I'll leave some for you. So why am I going to do this? Because I'm going to find the distribution for the number of balls in the first box at time one by conditioning on where I was at time zero and then looking at a transition. So for example, if you have currently zero balls in box one, then no matter what ball you pick, it's coming out of box two and going into box one. So you are definitely going to increase the number in box one. So this probability is one because this is like saying they're all in box two. There's currently zero in box one, and I'm going to randomly select a ball and switch boxes. So I'm definitely going to move one into box one. Similarly, if they're all in box one, so if we have all D of them there, the next move will have to be to remove one from box one. So that will bring us down to D minus one balls with probability one. Okay, I'm going to write down a couple more. So imagine a generic I going to I minus one. So this is certainly going to be for I greater than or equal to one and less than or equal to D. No, less than or equal to D minus one. I greater than or equal to one, less than or equal to D minus one. And maybe it'll even hold for D, I don't know. There's currently I balls in box one and the rest of them D minus I are in box two. And so if I want to drop the number of balls in box one down by one, then that means I need to select one of these I out of the total of D that there are for uh, selecting. And so I have probability i over d of pulling one of these eyeballs out of the total of d balls and moving it to the to the other box. I'll let you worry about exactly what i's that holds for. It actually does still hold here. So it actually holds for all of them. <laughs> so yeah, that's going to hold for i equals zero up through d. Okay, so uh, one more. Um, if we have say i balls in box one, how are we going to get i plus one balls in box one? That means we currently have this kind of picture going on. And that means that we randomly selected one of the d minus i out of the total of d to move back to box one. So this is d minus i over d. How do you set up the probability we want to compute? So the probability that x1 equals m, why am I using an m? I'm going to use J. Why not use an I? Because I'm going to condition on where we are before that. Use whatever letter you want. And I'm only thinking this, this is going to work for J equals 1 up to D minus 1, and that 0 and D are special cases. Although they weren't special cases in what I wrote above, so maybe not. But that this is what I'm, I'm going to claim I'm finding it for. OK, so I'm going to condition on where we were at time 0. So this is going to be the sum as i goes from 0 to d of the probability x1 is j given x0 is i. 
times the probability x0 is i. And we know this probability. It's a binomial probability, as weird as it looks in this problem. And we know these probabilities now. You just have to be careful and keep track of terms because a whole lot of these are 0. A whole lot of these are 0. Um, the, for a fixed j, we can only move to j if j is between 1 and d minus 1 inclusive. We can only move to j from i being j minus 1 or i being j plus 1. So this is going to, let me write that down. This is 0 if i is not j minus 1 or j plus 1. So as long as you're in this safe kind of middle ground here, because maybe something different will happen at the end point here. Um, you only have two terms that survive this sum and the rest zero out. So last thing I'm going to do, because I don't want to finish this, but um, I can write the probability x1 equals j given x0 is j minus 1 times the probability x0 is j minus 1 plus the probability x1 is j given x0 is j plus 1 times the probability x0 is j plus 1. So I think you can take it from there. These are binomial probabilities. And these are the pijs that we just found above. And so massage them and simplify them. And I claim that if you do this right, you will already have the answer to part b without any extra work. What could that mean? That might mean, wink, wink, that maybe you saw the same distribution at time one. If so, you've got something that's stationary. And if you think that might be the case, uh, then that'll help you simplify some of these combinatorics things. How many times can I wink with that eye? OK, um, questions on this one? So if you do one, uh, do part A of five and simplify it, if you have it right and simplify it nice, part B will be answered. All right, I got a questions about six and eight. I'm gonna knock eight out right away. Now it's, it's for grad students, so not, not all of you probably care about this problem, but I think I can do this one kind of quickly. You should look at the stationary equation, which says that pi j is the sum over i of pi i p i j and note that you can only make certain movements right you can only increase by one or decrease by one stuff like that so again in this sum a lot of terms are going to disappear so you're going to end up keeping the only terms that that are important are the i equals j plus one and i equals j minus one terms are the important one important ones that survive. So I would write out this equation for, where do we start with? We start with one in the state space. I would try to write out the equation uh, for pi one, for pi two, for pi three, um, just looking at the given probabilities. And then once you get up to, or if you write a, a generic pi i, you'll see that this, this relates to pi i minus one. And that relates to pi i minus 2. And so you can bring it all the way down to something pi 1. So it's looking like we have a stationary distribution, but you're supposed to show that, that, that 1 does not exist. And so in order to give the final answer here, you want to know what that question mark is. And that means you need to sum up all the pi's and set it equal to 1 to solve for the constant. And I think you'll find that you, you can't sum that up, that it's going to diverge. So let's do the more fun one, which is the bug problem. From this point on, I don't know. I can't help myself. There's going to be a lot of bug problems in here. So there is a grid, and the shape of the grid is not really important. What's important is that there are four positions, and they're all connected. So if there's a bug on any one of these, they can actually move to any other one of these nodes. 
Um, so we've got a red bug and green bugs. And so at each time step, we have a, a few types of movement. Um, and the order of the movement is kind of important. So we're, we want to know the long run percentage of time no green bug is on the grid. That sounds like a pie problem. And we want the long run percentage of time we're in state zero, which means that we should let our Markov chain, we should def define it to be the number of green bugs at time n. And then if we work this out as a Markov chain, we want to find the long run percentage of time when there are zero green bugs on the grid, which is a stationary and or limiting distribution at high zero. So this shouldn't be bad if we can write out the transition matrix. I will write out a couple of them for you. The state space here, we can have as many as three green bugs on the grid and we can have no green bugs on the grid. So the state space is zero, one, two, three. And then note that in each step, there's a few things that happen and in a certain order. So the first thing is that the red bug hops to a randomly selected node. If he lands on a green, then he eats it. And then if there's any space on this graph with probability one half, a new green bug will join. So if we're looking at say the uh, zero to zero, um, there's no green bugs and the red bug hops and is definitely not gonna eat anything. And the only way we're still gonna have zero, this is the probability of moving from zero to zero is the probability no green bug joins. Which is one half. Um, we can go from zero to one. The red bug hops and is really hungry because there's no green bugs there and certainly doesn't eat anything. But if a green bug joins, then we've moved up to a total of one. So we can go to one half. I'm sorry, we can go to one with probability one half. But the thing to keep in mind here is that the kind of sequence of moves. Uh, so number one, red hops and potentially eats. Two, green joins if there's space and also with a kind of coin flip kind of probability one half. Um, so we can't move from zero green bugs to two green bugs in one step because each step can have at most an increase of one. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna pick any other one here. Um, let's do two to one. So the probability we go from two green bugs to one green bug, this is the probability that, okay, we have a decrease. So red has to have eaten a green bug. So red eats and no green joins. Is this an R? Sometimes it's the whole word. Sometimes it's the G. Okay, these are not really independent. Um, this is the probability that no green joins given red, well, this, this kind of is, red eats times the probability that red eats. Um, the probability that red eats, there is currently, there are two, currently two green bugs on the grid and because the red bug can jump to any node, then he's, the red bug has a two out of three chance of eating a green bug. Two out of three. And given the red bug eats, um, this this actually doesn't the, the the joining of a green bug here does not depend on this because the green bug will join with probability one half as long as there's room. The green bug does not care if a bug was just eaten, but he should because scary. So the probability no green joins is one half. So I get uh, one half times two thirds or one third, and that is going to be this entry. Hey, how's the lag? Okay. I turn my world upside down for you. I hate the colors on this new screen. I think it's really good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, I see, I care. Okay, yeah. oh, thanks. So, um, all right, I would ask uh, about 
other questions, but now I think we have to do some new stuff. So I have an office hour right after class. And if you can't make those or any of the other office hours, please send me an email and I'll get you started or over a part you might be stuck on. We were talking about this runner and I already wrote this out because it's kind of long. Um, and I think you have it in the notes from last time all written out, except I did it there with uh, K pairs of shoes. So the runner has in this example, six pairs of running shoes and two doors from which she can enter or exit her home. Okay, so here is the house. There's a door here and a door here. One's a front door, one's a back door. I don't care. And um, the shoes are left in piles by each door. So out of six, each, each circle here is gonna represent a pair of shoes, not a single shoe. So maybe there's two here and four here. Those are each a pair. Okay, each day she randomly selects a door to depart from to go running. If there are shoes there, she puts a pair on. If there are no shoes, she runs barefoot. And on return, she randomly selects a door to return and drops off shoes if she's wearing them at that door. And I want the long run proportion of time this runner is barefoot. And I'm sorry, I know some of you might be trying to write that, but um, it's, it's in the notes. And also I'll talk about it more as we go through the problem. So I want the long run proportion of time he runs barefoot. That's not a question, that's a statement. Okay, so if we let, um, well, defining this Markov chain is kind of maybe tricky. I thought about a few ways to, to define the XN um, and this one worked out the cleanest for me. So I'm gonna let XN be the number of shoes, the number of pairs of running shoes at the departure door on day n. This is not the only way to do this. OK, um, so I don't have room for the matrix here. So I'll do it on the next one. But the state space is, it could be anywhere from 0 up to 6. OK, so. Um, Suppose it's zero. I'm not going to draw the whole house with the chimney and everything. <laughs> um, suppose there's zero here and six here. So the person leaves, leaves by, it doesn't matter if it's the front door or back door, they leave from the door with zero shoes. And the only way they could leave from a door with zero shoes the next day, so moving from Xn to Xn plus one, is number one, if a door still has zero shoes which it will because she ran barefoot, barefoot. So when she came back, she didn't actually change these numbers at all. Uh, so that happens with probability one, that part that there's still a possibility for zero shoes. And then the real, the really, what is, what the words, the probability she runs barefoot the next day is just the probability that she chooses this door again. You don't have to worry about front door, back door, which door, just the door with zero shoes. She chooses that one. So the probability of going from zero to zero is the probability that she chooses the zero door the next day because she actually didn't move the shoes around. So there's still a door with zero and a door with six. And this is probability one half. And then if there were zero shoes and she went for a run, she didn't move anything. So there were still zero and six. So the next day she could actually leave from the door with six pairs. And that's also gonna be probability one half. I'm gonna write out one more because it gets more complicated, maybe two more, because the more complicated rows and then I'm gonna fill in the matrix for you. Everybody okay? 
Okay, so starting from one, where can we go? My house gets worse and worse. So one and five <laughs> for two sides, not even pretending there are doors anymore. So she leaves on this day and there is one pair of shoes at her departure door. So she's wearing them. And when she comes back, if she goes back to the other door, now she has zero and six for the next day, or she goes back to the same door in which case she has one and five for the next day. So she, she definitely leaves with these shoes. And then the next day, she could have um, zero and six, depending on where she returned the shoes, or um, she can have one and five again. So that means that from, from state one, I can go from one to zero. I can go from one to five. Sorry, I'm trying to put these in order. One to one. I can go from one to five, one to six. And so you don't have to compute the probability or consider the probability. She leaves from the door with one shoe. That's already fixed and given. It's a conditional probability. But the probability there are zero shoes the next day when she departs depends on two things. I'm just going to write one out the long way. So this is the probability um, returns the shoes. I should have set up notation, right, events, to <laughs> five door so that there are zero and six the next day. And chooses the zero door the next day. So these are two things that are happening and we each have, you know, just random probability one half. So my claim is that this is one half times one half or one fourth. And actually all of these are gonna be one fourth. And the only one that you have to think a little bit harder about is what happens if there are three shoes at the departure door. Because when there's an, the same number on both sides, then the probability she leaves the next day. Let me just write the matrix for you. You don't need me to drag you through all of these. I mean, maybe you do, but what, what's that going to help us with? So I'm going to write down the whole matrix. And you let me know at any point, um, you know, later or next class, if you can't get these numbers. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so from zero, you can go to zero with probability one half and six with probability one half, the rest are zeros. From one, you can go to zero with probability one fourth, you can stay at one with probability one fourth, you can go to five with probability one fourth and six with probability one fourth, everything else is zero. From two, you can do a similar sort of thing. You can go down to one with probability one fourth. You can stay at two with probability one fourth. Um, from two, you can, yeah, you can go to four with probability one fourth and five with probability one fourth. And the rest of these are zero. So I had to pause there for a second. If we have two and four, then the next day we're either going to have one and five or two and four again, right? So if this is the departure door, the next day we have these four choices for the departure doors. And those are the four numbers, four positions of the matrix that got non-zero entries. Okay, the next one's a little trickier, but I'm not gonna drag you through it. So from three, you can go only to two, three, and four. And so, Three to two is probability one fourth, three to three, one half, three to four, one fourth, the rest are zeros. From four, you can only go to two, three or four, believe it or not. It seems like three should be that value that, that is special like that. But from four, you can go to two with probability one fourth, three with probability one half, and four with probability one fourth. And five is gonna be across the, the five row, zero, one fourth, one fourth, 
zero, one fourth, one fourth, zero. And finally, the last row, check out the notes for a um, cleaner version of this. But the last row is going to be one fourth, one fourth, and then the last two, one fourth, one fourth. <laughs> But those are tricky, so I would take some time to check to see if you can get some of those rows. But we want the long run pro probability of, of leaving with zero shoes at the door. So we want the pi zero. And so the pi equations, this is what I get for writing the opening slide and then putting homework after it. So the pi one equation, no, sorry, pi zero, for example, you're going to go down the first column and use these as coefficients for pi zero, pi one, pi two, out through pi six. So you're gonna get one half pi zero plus one fourth pi one plus one fourth pi six. I don't recommend doing this because I brought this problem up for a specific reason. This matrix is doubly stochastic. So if you can actually line up my rows and columns, you will see that the columns all sum to one. For example, column one has four different one fourths, and column zero has a one half and two one fourths. The columns sum to one, and when that happens, it's easy to find the stationary distribution. You don't need to set up these equations. Okay, so check this out. Um, number one, it's a doubly stochastic matrix, i.e., the columns sum to one. And so check this out. Here is the stationary equation. The thing we have to solve to find our pi distribution is pi j equals the sum over all i in the state space of pi i p i j. So we already know that if you sum, so this is uh, normally, if you sum the pijs over the, the entire row, so if you look at pij and you sum over all j in the state space, this has to be one because that's the sum of everything in the ith row. So that says from state i, you go somewhere with probability one. But now with this special matrix, we also have the column summing to one. So this is like the sum as i goes over s, the probability of going from ij has to be one because that sum I wrote there is the sum down the jth column. So looking at this, I am going to throw out a guess. This isn't well motivated, but once you see it, you'll see it. I'm going to throw out a guess for the pies. Um, if this pie, if these two pies were not even here, then I'd be left with the sum of pij over all i. So from this, I can see, hopefully, that a constant pi will work. Let me try to convince you down here. So a constant pi i will work since, let's call it c. This is the sum over i and s, c, p, e, i, j. And if you pull this c outside, we now know that sum is one. So we get c equals c times one. We get c equals c. So we can have constant probabilities across all the states. And because we have exactly seven states, starting from state zero up to state six, then uh, we're going to make them all equally likely. So uh, we have seven states, zero through six. And so I'm going to make pi zero equal to pi one equal out to pi six is one seventh. That's the point is if you have a doubly stochastic matrix, you can always do this, and you don't have to solve that system of equations. And if the solution is unique, then you really don't have to think about this anymore. And I was going to do a partial proof today of uniqueness, but um, I think given the time, I'm going to skip on to something else. Over the next couple of weeks, I will prove all of the pi theorems, when things exist, when things are unique. But for all of your homework problems and exam problems, you can assume that both of those are the case, unless you were explicitly told otherwise, like in problem eight. Bottom line, doubly stochastic matrix, you can make all the pi's equal. This, of course, assumes a finite state space, because if it was infinite, then 
then you can't do this. You'd have one over infinity. You would kind of have like all your pies approaching zero and they don't add up to one. So that doesn't make sense. I really wanted to prove this today, but I don't have enough time, but I'm gonna state our second pi theorem. So I'm calling this theorem pi two proof in the notes and it, it would take forever. It would take several classes for us to go through all of the proofs of all of the pi theorems, but I think I'll next time just hone in on a, a part of the proof that I think is important. But here it is. So for an irreducible Markov chain, a stationary distribution, so this is saying nothing about limits, a stationary distribution exists uh, if and only if all states are positive recurrent. If it's irreducible, right, all states are one thing or another. They're all transient, they're all null recurrent, they're all positive recurrent. So we need at least one positive recurrent state in our irreducible chain. And then in this case, we can actually say uh, what the pi should be, the stationary distribution. So in this case, pi i is one over the expected time to return to state i when starting from state i. So this is for all i in the state space where t is ti is the return time, which means you have to give it a chance to leave. So this is the minimum over all n greater than or equal to one such that xn is i. You don't want to start it from zero because then you wouldn't give it a chance to leave. So it would just be a first hitting time, not a first return time. Okay, so um, we don't have time to prove this, but I do wanna talk about the intuition here. Uh, it's irreducible, so you can get everywhere and you eventually will get everywhere uh, because everything communicates and if you run long enough, you'll get everywhere. So suppose you get to say state Two. Suppose you're running along and you end up in state two. If the expected number of steps starting from state two to return is say three steps. So suppose the expected number of steps to return to state two starting from state two is three. Then on average, once you hit state two, on average, it'll take you three steps to get back. And on average, it'll take you three steps to get back. And on average, it'll take you three steps to get back. And if you start looking at all these time steps, not doing that very well, <laughs> um, you're gonna spend in the long run, one third of your time in state two. Whatever happened here is gonna get washed out the longer you run it. And so the long run proportion of time although I didn't say anything about a limiting distribution here, only stationary, but the long run proportion of time of being in state two is gonna be one third. Because once you hit it on average, you'll take three steps to come back, which means you'll keep coming back like on average every three steps. So out of all these time steps, you'll be there one third of the time. Hopefully that feels good and intuitive. So I will put that proof in the notes and then go over a small part of it next time. So we've got an existence and uniqueness result. This says nothing about a limiting distribution, but for positive recurrence, existence, and uniqueness of a stationary distribution, if the chain is irreducible. Yay. Again, you can assume existence and uniqueness, but I know I'm making this confusing by saying just assume it and then throwing pieces of theorems in, but I can't, I can't stand leaving it like that. So for computational matters and homework, just assume. <laughs> but along the way, I wanna give you more and more of, of each of the proofs. Okay, so this brings us to one of my favorite parts of Markov chain analysis. This, what we're about to do shows you the real power of Markov chains versus your friends and roommates who've only had probability. If you ask them the kinds of questions we're about to answer, they are just gonna go spinning their wheels for days and you will have it like that. This is um, a section that I want to call the first step analysis of a Markov chain. Um, so 
I'm just going to do all of these. I have three things to answer here. We're obviously not going to get through them. I don't even know if we'll get through the first one, but I'm going to do all of these in an example. I've got a state space, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And I've got a transition matrix, 0, 1, 2, 3. Across the top row, I've got 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0, 0. Uh, across the one row, I have 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.5, 0. Uh, across the two row, I have 0 0.3, 0, 0, 0, 0.7. And finally, I've got on the bottom row, 0 0.2, 0, 0, 0.8. So I want to answer questions like this. This is question type one. I have three that I think are important that we'll go through. And these are not the only chances you'll have to do a first step analysis. So what does a first step analysis mean? Suppose I'm starting at state one and I want to figure out the expected number of steps until I first hit state three. If you ask your roommate who's just had probability and no Markov chains, they'd be like, okay, you can go from here to here, or you can go from here to here, or you can go here back to here or from here, and they'd have sums everywhere, and it would be awful. But with Markov chains, we do a first step analysis, which says, where do you go in one step, and then start counting from there. Okay, so to do this, I am going to set up a, a little notation. Well, I have to write down the question. So if the chain starts in state one, what is the expected number of steps to first hit state three? Okay, um, so I don't know if I should squish this in. I do owe you time from that one class when I went over 10 minutes. Yeah, I'm gonna give it back because I'm just gonna squish this in and it's not gonna make any sense because I'm already going so fast. But these three types of questions we're gonna do, you're gonna be amazed at what we can do, the power of Markov chains. So please come back. Thank you.